Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars with horse people from all around the world to bring you great information about topics that you either are curious about or kind of cutting edge, or, or maybe you just want to learn more. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Hay Soaker. Are you tired of the drudgery and mess of soaking hay? The Hay Soaker makes soaking hay convenient, easy, and hassle-free. Go to thehaysoaker.com. That's thehaysoaker.com to learn more. All right. So today my guest is Dr. Lydia Gray, and I'll let her do an intro, and we'll roll right into our topic. That was perfect. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> All right. So I am Dr. Lydia Gray. I did graduate from the University of Illinois College of Vet Med. We won't say when. And here's my cat again, like every five minutes. <laughs> Um, I am also a horse owner. I have a Dutch one blood right now. I uh, did have a trichaner, which was my, my, I, don't, I think you're not supposed to say heart horse anymore because they're all your heart horses, but he was near and dear to me. Um, I do dressage and driving and I've had many of the problems that I, I talk about in my presentations. Um, some of you may know me from my 16 plus years at Smart Pack Equine, if I look familiar or sound familiar. Um, that that may be why, or you may have seen me out at a horse show or given a presentation at Equine Affair or something. So I might get around. Um, all right, I think that's it. That's the important stuff. I just touched yep. on highlights here and there. Yep. And so if you have a horse with shivers, do pop that in the chat or ask questions as we go along. I'll I'll see where it's important in the conversation, where it fits in the conversation, and um, and we'll get your questions answered. And you'll ask questions yourself, Wendy, oh, right? Yeah. If I'm okay. Yeah. I always do. All right. So can I am I able to share now? I think yes. so, but I'll okay. check. Okay. Here I go. Here I go. So now I have to find my PowerPoint. Come on, you. There you are. Oops, that's the end. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Slideshow from beginning. Okay. Does that look good? Yeah, it looks awesome. Okay, so uh, we'll just go through what we're going to talk about is first, I'm sure your first question is who made me the expert, um, and I'll tell you, and then we'll talk about what exactly is shiver. So we'll go through the like formal official definition and talk about what it looks like. And then the longest part of this today is or tonight is what causes shivers. But that part starts with who gets it and why, and it might not be who you think all this information up in itself a couple of years ago. Uh, and then we'll talk about how to diagnose it and conditions that look like it, especially in the early stages. And then we'll end with, um, you'll see treating is crossed out because there really isn't a treat treatment for shivers, but you can manage it. Um, shivers, unlike some other hind leg locomotion uh, conditions is something that horses can have it even fairly, moderately to severely and still go on to be a high performing athlete so it can be managed all right so who made me the expert was my trainer that i mentioned newman and this is one of his glam shots i did one of those bring the photographer out and dress him up in all their fancy clothes and take pictures and he was such a um introvert she's like let's just get him on his own thinking about whatever he thinks about. And it's a very um, regal shot, I think. If you walk in front of me one more time. So what is shivers? It's a neuromuscular disease. And the important words in the definition are that it's chronic, which means it lasts a long time. It's gradually worsening or progressive. It's a movement disorder or gait abnormality. And the important part, most important part, it affects the ability to back up. That is the main criteria for does my horse have shivers? If you back them up and their gait disorder, their movement disorder really is apparent, then okay, you qualify. Your horse is eligible. You win the prize. Um, but if your horse is doing weird things with his back end, one or both legs, and you back him up and he's just fine, probably not shivers. Still have the vet out, but shivers is lower on the list. Did that make sense? 
Yeah, so it just makes me wonder, like, um, if you had a neurologic horse, how who couldn't back up? How do you differentiate the neurologic horse who can't back up from the shivers horse that can't back up? There's a whole worksheet of tests, neuro tests that vets do when they come out and look at a horse who you can't tell is he neuro, is he lame? Right. Yeah, and like pulling on the tail, crossing the legs, and seeing if they're staying there. We We'll walk them uphill and push their chin up. We'll oh, blindfold yeah. them. We'll turn them in small circles. There's a whole page of stuff. It's starting with the nose. Like we'll take a pair of forceps and touch all over the face and see if, if they're um, they're reacting properly. If they have a blank reflex, you know, you start with the cranial nerves and work towards the tail. So, okay. And so, so a horse with shivers would pass a neuro exam, but fail at backing up. Okay. Yep. So the classic signs of shivers are notice they all start with this trembling and that's where God its name, right? It could have just as easily been called tremors, but somebody somewhere a long time ago, this disease has been around for hundreds of years, uh, decided shivers was, was um, the right word. So to me, the main thing is, and I, this is a disease I can spot from as, as, uh, far away a mile away is the uh, when a hind leg is is picked up quickly held out to the side and it it sort of spasms or it it jerks it it hangs out there in midair for a little bit it's, it's called hyperflexion then the thigh muscles themselves might also tremble and in some horses, mine didn't do this, but the tail might stick straight out as a, like not come down the horse, not go up, but stick straight out and and also shake a little bit. So I've got a, a video in here. I'm not sure if it's next, but I'll try to explain this one more time. And then and then we'll watch some video. I have to just move this thing so I can see. So um, I think I, this is, this is pretty much what I explained, but the hind leg comes quickly off the ground when they're um, asked to back, turn in a small circle, sometimes just the first step forward. What's important when a vet is trying to sort out, is this shivers or is this something else? Does, it, does the horse walk out of it? So with shivers, it's often that first step forward that is not quite normal. And then you don't see it anymore. You you don't see shivers when they're trotting. Okay. When they're backing, you will see it every step. And so that, that distinction that is kind really of, important. I know this is kind of throwing another term into the mix, but string halt. Um, right. So string halt is also a quick raising up of the one hind leg it goes forward right under the body, almost, sometimes it does slap the belly, where in shivers, the leg goes out to the side. Okay. String halt comes up under the belly, under the horse's abdomen. You'll see string halt every single stride, walking and trotting. You'll see it sometimes when they're trying to go fast as a bunny hop. It's okay. a, it's a quite interesting gait. You don't see that with shivers. So, um, so shivers about the tail. Is, um, seen more than like obviously the diagnosis has a lot to do with backing up is not seen at trot. And I think that that's one of the like string halt, you can still see it walk and trot. Yep, that, and it's every step. Whereas shivers in forward motion gates goes away. And most importantly, shivers, the leg is held out to the side and shakes. Okay. Which makes Those, trimming them very difficult. Those are really important things. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're, yeah, we're going to get to that. So look at the um, material I have in italics. Horses with shivers, they know what they want to do. Pick it up a leg. They know you want them to pick up the leg. They, they just can't do it. 
And sometimes owners describe their horses as being frustrated, confused. They're like, I'm telling my leg to pick up. Why won't it pick up? And sometimes they get anxious about it. Mine did. And I, I would always try to reassure him. We've got time. There's no hurry. I'm going to ask for your leg. And if it takes me a minute or two for you to figure it out, that's no problem. I always had to reassure him. But so, so this process is called hyperflexion. And the other more rare form of shivers is called hyperextension. And it's when you ask a horse to back and instead of picking up a hind leg and holding it up and shaking it and then doing it with the other one if they have it in both legs, they simply take their legs way back behind them like they're parking out and then they lock and they can't move. And, and then, then they came back. So it looks, it looks quite different, but it's still classified as shivers. So, all right, now, now walk me through this. You said, play it. Play the and video. Then, okay. And don't worry about the writing. This wasn't, Oh, and this sound. Ugh. You this can wasn't kill the written sound. by a vet. Can I kill the sound? Yeah, kill the sound on your um on your yep, right like there. That? Kill the sound. Okay. Perfect. So it can you tell which leg well? Sorry? The, but that's string halt. No, no. That's what the video watch. said. Oh, let's okay, let's watch it. Let's watch and find out. Then I then I have. I got the other one at the end. Okay. So good, you can compare them. Because this is every it's hard to see coming under the body. And it's hard to see from the side. So wait till she walks towards you. But the leg coming under the body or out to the side? Under the body, right? Yep. Now he's trotting, still there, every step. Now he's going faster. So there's a bunny hop. Do you see where his butt came up? Yep. Sometimes both legs. Yep. And there's no holding it up and spasming. It's up and it's down. It's up and it's down, right? Right. There's even more bunny hopping. Yeah. He yeah, because he's thinking maybe it would be easier to canter. He says, nope, I he can, he does later, but he's like, oh, cantering is hard too. He loses it a little bit when he canters. Okay, so so this is clearly string hard because it's going forward. The leg comes up really high underneath, and he bunny hops. And it's, it's every step. And are we saying that yeah. there's a relationship between string halt and? Nope. I just what? Nope. I just wanted to show um, a horse with string halt. Ignore this up here. This is when I make changes to my PowerPoint the day of. I'll fix this before we. Um, um, okay, so that it, should say string halt. <laughs> yeah yeah okay yep yeah. so all right get back on here there we go so what causes shivers and who who gets it and this is this is this, this 2015 study is the one that upended what everything we thought we knew about um shivers you'll notice the little brain up there this is this is my adult coloring pad so i did a pretty good job there's a couple of places where i went outside the line but in 2015, and I forget which group discovered it, but we found out that shivers is actually due to a to damaged cells in the cerebellum. The cerebellum, which is sometimes called the little brain, the cerebrum is the part in front that I left gray. That's the part of your brain where you do all your thinking. Your emotions are there too, and your senses are there too. The, the cerebellum is what takes the information from the, the main brain and then fine tunes it and coordinates it, packages it up and sends it out to the body and says, do this. So it's res responsible for coordination, posture and balance. So do you see where I'm uh, in a minute here? Uh, you're getting some thoughts, right, Wendy? Yeah. Coordination, posture and balance. Okay. Um, so Stephanie Wahlberg is my hero. 
And if you have ever had a horse with a muscle problem, you have probably talked to her or read something by her or sent her a sample, sent her lab a sample. She is the, the guru of muscle disease in horses. And I just found out today when I was at all her websites, double checking information, she, she is retiring from Michigan State University. So I don't know what the world is going to do, but um, this is a quote from her that says, basically, the cerebrum forms the plan and the cerebellum carries out the plan. And I've been thinking of a couple analogies about this. You know, the cerebrum could be the, um, I don't know, e executive branch of the government and the cerebellum could be Congress or anybody who in enforces could be cerebellum, but it's the, it's the part of the brain that it does the communication and schedules. It's the scheduler. So like a, a warehouse, you know, that all the people in the, the office have these ideas, let's make widgets. And then it's the people in the warehouse that make the widgets. There we go. So um, somebody's asking, well, it might be a little early to ask that whether um, this is related to cerebellar hypoplasia in cats but probably not because the cerebellum is actually present. Um, um, I'm going to have to look at that one again. It's, it's, it's similar in that it's damaged to cells of the cerebellum. Like in horses, um, there's cerebellar abiotrophy, where the cere cerebellum doesn't, isn't formed completely. In this case, um, this happens this isn't congenital, like the horses aren't born with it. It's something that happens to them. That's the part we don't know yet. But what, what happens to them is, is there's there, and it should say cerebellum. Those full of mistakes. The damaged cerebellum cells are called Purkinje cells. And the Purkinje cells are the cells, and, the, and this is a picture of one down here. They're, they're beautiful. And they're, look how complicated and how many neurons there are and how many dendrites and how much they communicate. It looks like coral. So they're responsible, yeah, yeah, for communicating the plan of movement. Keep going. Yeah, I can't see. <laughs> so, so this should read the damaged cerebellar cells. Are yes, okay. yep, yep. Um, so specifically what happens now in, in shivers is the muscles that flex and extend the hind leg. Let's let's take the human arm for example. You've got the biceps on the front here and the triceps in the back. And I can do this because my biceps are contracting. So my flexors, okay. And I can do this because my triceps are flexing. So extensors, okay. Imagine what, what would your arm do if your cerebrum said, um, do a bicep curl. And the cere cerebellum went, okay, I'm gonna tell the arm, the right arm to do a bicep curl, except the cells that, that say that are damaged and they can't communicate. And so what happens to the arm is they get the biceps, the flexors get the muscle contract and the extensors get the message contract. And so everything fires at once. And that's why you have the spasm because it's the leg, it's all the muscles on the leg firing at once. On top of that, the off switch doesn't work either. The muscle, the, the switch that says, okay, you can stop firing now, that's broken. Now ask me a question. Is that well, like, yeah, it's just, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like we usually think of this problem as being a leg problem, not a brain problem. Uh, um, so now we're finding out that shivers is a brain problem, most specifically a cerebellar brain problem with damaged Purkinje cells. Purkinje, like per you like that? Purkinje. <laughs> per um, that are misfiring so now the big question is how did that happen how did they get messed up that's what they don't know but experts are looking at it it's possible you know one one of the things that, that they always look at when there's a disease or condition is is there a genetic component 
is there DNA that's mutated that's making us do this? The, and I can tell you, because I, I was around when this was first discovered and I heard it right from Stephanie. So the way she tells the story is uh, they had a great pathologist and a pathologist is the guy that only stays in the lab. You send him samples and he looks at them under the microscope. Maybe he stains them. And they had a horse that was donated because he, his shivers was so severe, his quality of life had become poor. He was dangerous and they euthanized him. And they said, we want our horse to help other horses. So please take tissues, use him, study him, get to the bottom of this. And, and they did. So they sent their poor pathologist, the entire spinal cord of the horse from the tip of his tail to the brain. Wow. Thinking like you just said, it was a hind leg issue. The poor, poor pathologist started making slices. I mean, a millimeter thick right at the end. And he didn't find the abnormal tissue until he got to the brain. But he figured uh, it out. So, so, so basically the nerves to the leg are fine. The ones that are like coming from the spinal cord. Yeah. But the ones that that tell it what to do aren't fine. Right. So let me do this slide and the next one will make this come all together. Okay. So we're still on the what causes it and who and who gets it. But when we compare and contrast shivers and string hall, it begins to be clear that. Horses with shivers, they're better at the natural, natural gait, the forward gait, the faster gait, walking, trotting, cantering, rather than the, the unnatural, the slow, the learned things we teach them. Backing up, lifting a leg up for the farrier. So experts suggested or suspect that there are actually two different cerebellar pathways for natural actions that they do in the wild on their own. They're born, but they, they, they're a foal and in an hour they're up, up, you know, that's natural. There's a, there's a cerebellar pathway for that and it works just fine. But there's a different pathway for learned and that's the one that's affected by these Purkinje cells being damaged. And one of the ways that the researchers got out of this theory was, I was at um, a, a talk where they asked people to describe things they had noticed about their horses, their shivers horses. And, and I piped up that I see a, saw a difference when I backed him in hand versus I backed him under saddle. So when I was on the ground and they asked him to back, he, he'll look like the horse at the end of this video that we'll show you. But when I was in the saddle and I asked him to back, 100% totally fine, couldn't tell a difference, got an eight, because I he was a dressage horse and you have to back in dressage classes. And I didn't interpret it, I just told, it was Carrie Fino, who was one of Dr. Valberg's um, associates. And I just said, I'm just giving you this information because I kept it in my journal and you can do with it what you will. But then a lot of people piped up with, weird little things they notice about their shipper's horse. So, um, oh, here's some other, other conditions. So we talked about string halt, the upwardly fixed patella. That's when the patella locks, you know, uh, fibrotic myopathy in the, the hamstrings. It's, it looks a little bit like string halt, but it never gets that severe, it never, it never, it's, it's a quick up and a quick down, but it doesn't go so high. It's more like they just can't extend their leg forward and back because the, there's scar tissue in the hamstrings. Um, stiff horse syndrome is relatively new. It's named after stiff person syndrome. And th that's the only one that, because there's really subtle differences between some of these. Uh, that one causes muscular hypertrophy. So muscle, muscle mass grows in volume, where most of these cause muscle atrophy. Shivers does too. Um, we know EPM causes muscle atrophy. And then equine motor neuron disease, not only does the muscle 
you lose muscle, but the horses lose weight terribly. I think they probably, though, the equine motor neuron disease is a whole horse disease. The whole horse looks really terrible. But each of these is a little bit different. And um, that's why you pay your vet the big bucks. So let's see. Um, I think I may have missed a slide. Is it okay if I go back? Will that? Okay. Let me just see. No, it must be later. If it's not, I will find it because I know I made it. It's, it's, of course, the best slide in the talk. Okay, so um, diagnosing it now. I mentioned this, the horse owner, when you notice your horse doing not normal things, you have to keep a journal. And, and the things you write down, I mean, I write down stuff every day because you never know what's going to be important. Like if you have a horse who head shakes, we'll, we'll have to do that one, Wendy. Oh, head yeah. shaking, you discover oh. the triggers by journaling. Um, but write down, you know, the weather. If anything different happened, they moved to a new paddock or pasture, you trailer that day, you show that day, you had a lesson. Um, any, anything that's that's write down everything, even the normal stuff, because it, it takes a while to figure out if your horse has this disease and, and what might be um, causing episodes. And then be sure and describe the episode and don't, don't interpret it or over-interpret it. Just write exactly what you see. Better yet, video it. Because you know, whether it's your vet coming out or your own doctor or taking your car to the mechanic, you can have a problem every day. And then the minute you have someone look at it, you cannot reproduce or recreate that problem to save your life. But it's, it's embarrassing and it's, it's a waste of money and time. And then you go home and there your horse does it again. So video is, is your friend. Um, what, so what the vet will do is they, they'll wanna see your journal or at least have you highlight some key parts of it. And that's, that's called taking, taking a history. They want to know the breed, the age, the gender, the um, what you do with the horse, how long you've had him, how he lives, what he eats, everything about the horse. When we're, when we see dewormed, when was he vaccinated? Everything, um, and then they'll perform a full physical or a comprehensive physical exam, and it will include, like we talked at the beginning, some lameness tests. Maybe they'll flex the horse, and then some neuro tests. Turn him in a small circle, see how he does. Um, based on those results, the whole time they're narrowing things down. And they have a list, it's called a, a differentials in their mind. Well, it could be this, this, like 20 things. And then as they work through the history and they work through the physical exam, that list of 20 things becomes 15, becomes 10, becomes five. And now maybe I can't uh, reduce it anymore. And so, her, sorry, someone's calling me and I'll say, please text me. What they, they might say, okay, and now we have to run some tests, whether it's blood work or maybe it's x-rays or ultrasound um, or even take a biopsy of muscle and send the tissue in. But that's as much to rule in a disease or condition as to rule out one. Yeah. Uh, I get asked this a lot. Is there a relationship between shivers and PSSM? And so, there is definitely overlap. And so I made a Venn diagram to show there's horses that just have shivers and there's horses that just have PSSM and there's ones that have both. And for an example, I will say Belgians. There's a almost 20% incidence of shivers in Belgians. And I forget what the incidence of PSSM is, but it's also high. So, so does that kind of make you think that there's a genetic component when you have it like that in a breed? I think that's what, yes, I think that's what's making the researchers look to let's, let's, you know, study the genes for shivers, but note that shivers is a cerebellum tissue issue, tissue issue, and PSSM is muscle tissue, right. but it can still be on the same gene. Right. So then um, not treating, but managing shivers. 
people have tried everything for this. And there are some things that, that work for some horses that don't work for others, or they work for a horse for a while and then they don't work anymore. It is a, a progressive disease, um, but there's nothing that treats all horses all the time. So you just have to use, keep your journal when you start trying things and try one thing at a time. So you know, did it make my horse more comfortable? Did it reduce the um, severity of the shivers? Or did it reduce the number of, of times he raised his leg or the, the, um, the frequency of it? And, but the things we do know that help are um, what you feed them in terms of supplements, their movement, how much they're allowed to move or not allowed to move. And then there are some, some special considerations that uh, people have just noticed and now they become veterinary recommendations. Let's see, I gotta move my head so I can see this. So under the, the what can we feed them part, antioxidants, hardly ever a bad thing. Um, so here you're giving them to maybe help the Purkinje cells in the brain, but also to help the, uh, the muscle and nerve tissue because we know vitamin E especially uh, targets muscle and nerve tissue. And so if there's oxidative stress or free radical generation, then the vitamin E it, it seeks that out in muscle and nerve tissue and will sort of scavenge those free radicals, remove them so the tissue is healthier. Because it's, it's, it's traumatic on the tissue. I mean, if you've ever seen a, a sugar source in real life, it's, um, it's, it's traumatic for the person as well because you can see that their intent is there. They want to pick up the leg. You know what they do sometimes? And this is documented. I thought it was just me or my horse. Let's say I want to pick up, because Newman's was the worst in the uh, left hind. And so let's say I want to pick up the left hind. So you go back and whatever your cues are, and mine were just facing the back, and I would kind of lean into him and shift his weight to the right hind. And then I would ask, and you know he'd have it picked up. The shivers horse, Newman included, they'll be like, oh, 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 I know how to do this. And they'll give you the right hind. Yeah, they try to give you the leg that that they can do, even though yeah. you're asking for the leg that they can't do. Yeah, and and I I I don't want to talk about human diseases, but I think there's some um, similarity there that it, it has a lot to do with intention, and so that's why the natural forward gates, like a horse that's spooking, never shivers, because it's a reaction, it's a reflex. There's no coordination. There's, the Purkinje cells probably aren't involved in a spook because it goes, it sometimes just goes right to the spinal cord and back. It doesn't even go to the brain. Like, you know, when the doctor hits your knee and it, you're, you kick out, that doesn't go to the brain. It just goes to the spinal cord and back. So something like that, there's no, there's no shivers. But when they try, when they think in their brain, she gave me the cue to pick up, I'm going to pick up that's when they, the shivers really doesn't work. In, in my research today, when I was finishing this up, I read something that was really exciting. The Purkinje cells there, the, um, the, the language they use to communicate is, is via the endocannabinoid system. Wow. I'm wondering if CBD might be beneficial for shivers horses. Maybe there's not enough cannabinoids in the system, the, the endocannabinoids are the, the, your natural ones, your internal ones, the ones your, your body makes. So if that's true, then supply the horse with external cannabinoids. Would love to do an experiment. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And it's, you know, we're learning more and more and more about cannabinoids and realizing that we're designed to have them. <laughs> right, right. Um, so a lot of people feed the, the PS, one of the PSSM diets and it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help because 
fat and sh fat and sugar don't really have any effect here. Exercise though and turnout does make a difference because the the fitter a horse has is um, the more active they are, the more they move, the better they do. It's when they're kept in a stall, not turned out, only turned out a few hours a day that their signs worsen. So these are horses that I would think about finding a place where they're maybe not stalled. Maybe, and, and I found a place where I could keep Newman. He had a, a 14 by 14 stall that was never closed. The door was never closed and he had his own run out and his own pasture. And it was the perfect setup for him. Um, and then the special considerations are, I also had the world's best farrier in that he understood that Newman wasn't being bad or not. He never punish a shivers horse. Um, he and, and these horses get tired easy, so he couldn't hold. He couldn't hold his left leg up. The farrier had to hold it, so he put him on a stand. Right? Why? Why use your use yourself up holding his horse's leg up? Even he can't hold it. Put him on a stand. Um, you can even use. Um, there's all sorts of, of like stocks. People put draft horses in special stocks that that hold their legs up. Um, and elephants, you can teach them to put their feet in certain places to have them, have them hold up. But my farrier would go around. He wouldn't do each foot completely. He would go around the horse about four times and he would only hold each foot up like a minute. Mm. And it worked fabulously. Some people have even learned to stand their horse in a sand and dig around the foot so you don't even have to pick it up. I knew somebody taught their horse to sit on its butt. Wow. Yeah. They made, they built a little chair in a corner of a stall, a little, you know, bench. Um, and then the other thing that the vets have noticed is if you, if you give a horse some IV sedation, their shivers will calm down a little bit enough to allow a farrier to trim or shoe the horse. In the same um, I put, you, you've got to know, learn through your journaling, what are your horse's triggers? So for some, it's trailering. For others, it's cold weather. Sometimes it's stepping over an obstacle or just a change of footing. There's this experiment, I think you can probably see it on YouTube, where with Shiver's horses, if you put a pail of water down and they reach towards it, it starts an episode. It's, it's just, it's really heartbreaking to see. Um, so yeah, so for resources, the, the main place to go to learn more about this and any other muscle disease is the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine, because that's where Dr. Uh, Valberg was until just recently. Wow. And I want to point out again that while we can't cure this disease and there isn't a treatment, um, some horses do quite well and can go on to perform. I didn't reach the highest levels with Newman, but I reached like the middle of, of every discipline we attempted. So, but you just, you know, be safe. When some of these horses, um, they, they stop laying down and become sleep deficient and that's a whole other mess. And so, and, and, and you know, if, if you can't trim the horse's feet, you aren't doing it a favor by keeping it alive. So there, there may come a time with a certain horse that a tough decision has to be made. Is it progressive? It is. It is. At what age do, do, can you see it occur? So that's the slide that I um, can't seem to find. It disappeared. My cat stole it. Um, like I said, they're not born with it. Some will start as early as two years of age. If, if let me just make sure before I say this, most cases develop after age five though. So starting at two would be, yeah. is not the most common. Most start after five. If a horse has not shown signs of shivers by age 10, they're probably not gonna have the disease. So you can okay. cross it off your list. Now here's the really mind blowing part. Um, if you think about 
the the it's the cerebellum that where this disease originates. They've now combined that information with owner surveys, with videos, with biopsies, with all the data they have collected on shivers. And they found that horses that are 16, three and taller are at a, have a higher rate of shivers. Huh. So taller horses and what breeds are you gonna see taller horses in uh, thoroughbreds, warm bloods for sure and draft yeah. horses. Yeah. Yeah. And then geldings. Shivers is found three times more commonly in geldings than mares. What about stallions? I don't have any information on that. That's kind of, yeah, well, you have to wonder. Uh, I mean, this is all really, really fascinating. So we have- What one... usually happens with, st with stallions is the information, the data they have is from owners, riding horse owners. And by far, the vast majority of them are mares and geldings. Right, right. So it could just be a preponderance of mare and gelding data and not enough stallions for the data to be yeah, does accurate. Have, have any real data. That's my guess. That's oh. my guess. So someone's saying that her hoof trimmer does her mare on the ground with a wood chisel. So they've come up with a solution for, mm -hmm. for doing that foot. Um, and somebody's asking, are the shivers horses suffering? She's having a hard time laying down and she has no problem to get up. Um, it doesn't seem to be painful. The suffering they do is the confusion, the frustration, and at least in my horse, he seemed anxious when he, when he told his leg to do something and it didn't do it or it did the opposite. You know, I have some experience in telling my leg to do something and not having anything happen when I had me, the horse too. slip over on me and break yeah, my hip yeah. socket. Yes. And it's, it's a bizarre feeling to say do it and nothing happens. So I can right. imagine for the horse, it would be just as disturbing that your, your brain is saying, do this thing and nothing's happening. Or So I wanted to ask you, Wendy, now that you've seen this and as much now, I mean, this is as much as we know about shivers. What do you think about, and, and maybe you've seen it, shivers using surefoot in a shivers horse? Well, that's what um, so, somebody's saying is um, any experience with shivers or string home horses. So I yeah. I have uh, had people work with some horses. And in fact, somebody says, I teach my mare to lift her legs with the surefoot pads and positive training so she can lift it low and rest it on the pad, but she's still not able to lift it high enough to trim her. So mm. um, I know I have one instance where I know the horse had shivers. I know the person used surefoot pads and I know it made it better for the farrier. Uh, but I don't have, um, uh, you know, like people don't report back to me. So right. um, I don't have a lot of information. Somebody else says, we have a horse on free lease that our vet diagnosed with shivers. Came to us over 10 years ago with EPM history twice. Is oh. it possible that shivers, they had shivers all along? He's in his late 20s and we've retired him from under saddle. You mean, did he have shivers and not EPM? uh came to us over 10 years ago yes did he have shivers and not epm well well i mean sure it's possible but if he was if he got better then that was probably epm because shivers horses don't generally get better better so if he, if he got remarkably better on treatment then probably was EPM. Yeah. So um, is it all draft horses or particular breeds? Um, the data that Dr. Valbert's lab shares is in Belgians, but I think that's because she has ready access to a large herd of Belgians. Yeah, I think it's, it's that's part of it. Um, so I want to kind of go back. Um, she thinks he had shivers the whole time when we had him. He's a th Clyde thoroughbred cross. Mm. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. So the per per Kenji cells. I'm I'm. This is my own personal interest right now. Um, and I'm going to ask a question that I know you can't answer. And the question is, I so often see horses using surefoot pads that restores their function 
I think of it like rebooting the computer and you just reset and you wiped away all this other stuff and you're back to the original program. Mm -hmm. And given that you're telling us that there are Purkinje cells that are more uh, associated with learned movements, like holding a foot up for a shirt for a farrier, mm -hmm. is it possible that somehow the surefoot pads are kind of resetting that that or shifting the I, I would go beyond that and say that um we we like nervous tissue is not very plastic in that it doesn't regenerate and uh like once a nerve cell is damaged it, you can't repair it however you can create new pathways you can make new brand new tissue so i'm wondering if the surefoot is either sending messaging back through the natural more natural not learned pathway or it's creating because you know that that Purkinje cell looked like a tree almost with branches yeah. and yeah I wonder if it's just making a new branch and saying none of those work try this branch now yeah I mean I I, I totally because I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner I totally believe in building new neural pathways so that you have new possibilities right the the piece that I find an answerable from that perspective is the rapidity with which I see a change that sticks. And if we're going to build a new neural pathway, that actually is going to take a little bit of time, more than just an hour. Absolutely. And, and that's why I'm like, yes, I believe in building new neural pathways. That's what my job is with Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I'm, I'm over here watching this change occur super fast and go, mm. how did you reset that when, you know, like the first horse I have, I keep going back. He was appeared lame when I started and in 15 seconds, he's moving sound, you know? I well, mean, and so that comes to the piece that we don't know is why are these Purkinje cells damaged? What, what damaged them? Are they damaged beyond repair or are they injured and healable? I mean, I just don't think we've seen, we've biopsied enough shivers horses to know. Yeah, so somebody's asking, could the cells be damaged by the horse pulling back while tied? Um, the, the brain is too deep in, inside the skull, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's not, it's not physical damage. It's things that I saw were like toxins and, and, and it's, it's, it's things that that pass the blood brain barrier that get into the the um, central nervous system. Um, rabies, rabies, for example, it, it's a virus that passes the blood brain barrier, and that's it. It part of the damage it does is to Purkinje cells. Oh, so oh. It can be can be an infection, can be a toxin, but it has to be something that is right in the local vicinity of the Purkinje cells. Wow. So. Uh, yeah, somebody's asking EPM. Um, but if it was EPM, then if you treated the horse for EPM, in theory, it would get better. Well, here, here so here, here's a question. Um, couldn't EP, because EPM can, the, the damage you see in the prognosis is, is reliant on where the infection decided to set up in anywhere along the central nervous system. Well, what if, what if the brain tissue that the, the organism where it set up housekeeping was in the cerebellum and was in the area of the Purkinje cells? I mean, uh, I don't know. It's certainly a possibility because it yeah. can get into the nervous system. Mm -hmm. I, I think it brings up, but I have to say, okay, so to kind of put this in a nutshell, EPM, not sorry, shivers has always been something that we can, you don't have a video of a horse with shivers, do you? Oh, <laughs> um, yes. Hang on. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Okay. <laughs> Yes, 
He has something else too. I'm curious if anybody else, anybody sees it, but just focus on the, the shivers element for now. And you're not seeing it right now. Everybody agree? Right. We're seeing right. other things, but not shivers. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah. And, and so what it, I, I was going to say, is it commonly in both legs or just one? It, it can be either. And, and is there a percentage of left hind versus right hind? No, this horse has it in both. I think it's more in the left from what I've read. Okay. So he's frustrated. She's frustrated. He's like, I can't back. He's like, I'm, I'm trying. So to me, his left hand is worse. Yeah. But he's got it in both legs. Right. Yeah. Which is also, um, there's a lot, a lot of head toss. I don't know that it's, I would call it head shaking, like head shaking syndrome. No. A lot of, a lot of, I can't, I can't coming out of that head. It's, yeah. It's and it's not no. So you see his other problem. He's, he's really super lame on that left front. Yeah. This poor guy. He has a leg to stand on that right front. Which is going to get hammered. <laughs> yeah. But can you see the difference between this and the string halt? Yeah. It doesn't come up fast and get slammed down fast. It, it comes up and the, the extensors in the front and the flexors in the back. Um, they're Would just you consider each that other. A, a really severe case? I've seen worse. I've seen worse. But oh. so, um, yeah, if you just unshare your screen. Yeah. Um, so the bottom line is we might have all thought it was a rear end problem. It's not. It's a brain problem. It's a cerebellar problem. It's damage to nerve cells, which are not going to regenerate, which can be pro progressively worse and can be managed in, in but not treated, but not treated. Like there's not a drug that you give them. There isn't a surgery that you can do. You know, up upwardly fixated patella, you can do a surgery and correct it. Right. Uh, equine motor neuron disease, you can give them vitamin E and they get better. EPM, you can, there's a drug. And they might get it again, but, um, but there's yeah, a drug. You, can, you can treat it. Stiff horse you know. syndrome, we're going to have to talk about it at some point because I have never heard about that. Well, one. I think even even less is known about that than shivers. So okay. that's that's a relatively new new condition. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, so, you can three times more geldings than mares, 16, three and taller. Right. Draft horses. Um, um, but that yeah, was not a really big exactly horse what, the video what, you just showed us either. He wasn't all that. No, big. he was maybe 16 hands. So, uh, oh, and, and so the, the taller the horse, the more likely is to have it. And it rarely seen in ponies, but it can. And also mostly the hind legs, but it can be seen in the front legs even the front, the, the front neck, the front neck as opposed to the back neck, the neck, the head. So you can see shivers in the front, but this is extremely. Actually, I think I did see a horse with shivers uh, in the front once. Um, and I would just say, you know, sure foot pads could be helpful, but they're not going to resolve anything. But if it gives your horse any kind of comfort, it's certainly worth trying. Especially, I mean, if, it, if they relax your horse, relaxation helps this not be so dramatic it can take a this to a this yeah. you you could surf it before the farrier right and get the horse all calm and, and peaceful you know guide to meditation before the farrier and then you might have a better episode better 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 uh and then have the talk with your farrier about the fact that your horse can't help it this he's not doing it to yeah. you yeah don't 
don't, you know, jerk on the lead or elbow to get into the back or rasp in the belly or any, any of that. He's, he's trying really hard. Right. Wow. Well, this has been a fascinating webinar. It's been um, enlightening to say the least, because, you know, people ask me all the time if Surefoot's going to help shivers. And I, I can only oh, say, really? oh, yeah, I get that. Oh. Question. Um, I think it's if I if I had known about Surefoot when I had new human, I absolutely would have tried it. Yeah. And, you know, I can only talk about the one horse that I definitely know they used Surefoot pads when I made them better for the farrier. When I went to go back to see if I could get a video, the horse had, was no longer with her. Um, but it's certainly worth a try. It, it, as you say, anything that's going to calm the horse down. And I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by this learned versus innate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't wait to, to hear yeah. more about that as they discover yeah because I think that's really fascinating. And that kind of stuff was found out purely by talking to owners who were keeping good journals. Yeah. Um, so somebody's asked me what kind of pad I would recommend. I, I typically would start with like the hard pad to give the horse support before you move mm -hmm. to soft a pad and find out, wow, we can't handle that. Right. Yeah. So um, that's typically, uh, they might wind up liking something softer, but if you go too soft too fast, you might overface them and then they're going to be like, oh, I can't do this at all. Yeah. So, you yeah. Always better off starting harder and going softer. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, if there's no more questions, we'll wrap this up. And thank you, Dr. Gray. It's actually um, been quite interesting and informative. Will you give me the fun topics? I know. I can't really wait. cool. We got more for. of a fun topics with the stiff horse. I understand stiff horses. <laughs> well, um, we could package it up and and do all the the really rare, unusual muscle. Oh, conditions. awesome! Great idea. Great idea. Okay. We'll do that. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Have a good evening, and just remember to tell your friends they can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Have a great night. Bye. All right.